presentations in the main conference hall and I'm inviting the happiest person in the world that, that's, well, if you know him, you will understand why I'm saying that Mike Hines from Amazon, from Seattle, welcome! Thank you very much! And now we applaud I appreciate that guys, thank you very much Thank you for coming to learn about what the top 50 apps and games do in the Amazon App Store that the rest of us don't. And this is really exciting for me. A, a, a little bit about who I am and what I do. I actually have one of the best jobs at Amazon. They pay me to fly around the world talking to developers sharing what we've learned in the Amazon App Store with you guys so that you guys get to be more successful. And in the process, I get to play a lot of your games and learn about what you guys are doing. This is fantastic. Now, we have a lot of apps and games in our App Store, over 700,000, and we sell these 700,000 apps and games in, over, in 236 countries and territories worldwide. So we actually have a whole lot of data on what does and doesn't work in in-app purchasing. And that's what I want to share with you guys right now. So, to start with, I want to talk about how the top 50 did versus the rest of us in terms of the actual numerical results. Now, okay, I owe you an explanation. When I say the rest of us, um, I'm including myself in that because none of my games are actually in the top 50. If you have a game in the top 50, please feel free to raise your hand and tell me what your experience is. And other, than, other than that, maybe you're like me and you're just kind of with the rest of us. So we'll look at the top 50 versus the rest of us. Now, we started by doing a cohort analysis. It's a don't worry about what cohort really means. It's simply a way of saying that we took a hundred installations of each of the top 50 games, we normalized the data to start at the same time, and we compared it against 100 installations of similar games from the rest of us. And then we took the opportunity to compare those side by side in the data that I'm gonna share with you. So, obviously the first thing you get is 100 installs of games from the top 50, compared to 100 installs from the rest of us. Now this is interesting. Of those 100 installs, quite a lot of them were never opened. I mean, that's kind of shocking that you have almost half the games that were downloaded never got launched. All right, why is that? Well, to some extent, incentivized downloads play a large part in that. Uh, you're familiar with rewarded ads, where if you watch an ad and you take some action, maybe you get a, a gem pack or maybe you get some extra lives. And often, the reward that you get means you need to install a game first. And that game then becomes what we call a zombie app on your device. It sort of sits there forever and never gets open. Now, if you've got a bunch of games sitting on your device that never get open, well, yeah, you're going to uninstall some. That makes perfect sense. You'll notice that the top 50 actually have more games uninstalled than the rest of us. Why is that? Well, games from the top 50 can tend to be a little bit larger. They take up more space than games from the rest of us. And when you're going through your device looking for games to delete to make more room, well, you look at the ones you don't play, you need to delete the biggest ones first. Um, so don't read too much into that other than, other than that. Now, um, if we know how many are being downloaded, how many are being uh, unopened, how many are being uninstalled, the really interesting thing is how many are actually paying. Now, what we've noticed in the Amazon App Store is that for every 100 apps downloaded, three of them start generating in-app purchase revenue. So that's about 3% of downloads. And while that's interesting, I'm going to call everything in these gray boxes up here retention data, kind of standard what you would expect to see retention data. But that's not all we wanted to look at. 
we also wanted to see how these people were spending their time in the game. So we gathered some additional information based on the amount of time they spent in each session, the number of sessions they had each day, and then the total minutes they had. So this is fairly simple. You take your average session length in minutes, multiply it by the number of sessions they have per day, and then you can come up with the session, the total number of minutes they play per day. This is important. I want you to keep an eye on this. This number here is going to change over the next month, and the share of minutes that the top 50 get is going to increase um, significantly. And one of the reasons it will is because the top 50 are going to show that they can actually derive more sessions per day than the rest of us can. But we didn't want to stop there. In addition to seeing how people spent their time, we wanted to see how did they spend their money. We got that data. Now, about that data, we went ahead and normalized this data so that data from the rest of us is always set at 100%. That way, we can compare it to the data from the top 50 and see what percentage increase or maybe decrease the top 50 saw in terms of revenue. This makes the numbers a lot easier to understand. So on the first day, you see that the top 50 actually purchase 12% more items than are purchased by our customers, by the rest of us. And not only do the top 50 sell 12% more items, they also sell it for a 36% higher price. Wow. Well, no secret, if you sell more items and you sell them for a higher price, well, the result is the average revenue per paying user for the top 50 is 54% uh, higher than it is for the rest of us. Well, what do things look like on day two? On day two, the retention data stays pretty equal for the top 50 and for the rest of us. You'll see an average session length, session length and average session count. We're starting to see a little bit of change towards the top 50, but you'll notice the biggest change here um, is in the average selling price. This is not because the top 50 did anything wrong. Actually, it's because the rest of us actually started doing something right the rest of us actually started selling a little bit deeper into our IEP catalogs, and we started selling more things from the higher end of our catalog. So that was a really good thing that we started doing to catch up and make that gap narrower. All right, what about day three? Day three, still fairly statistically equal retention data for the top 50 and the rest of us, but look at the difference in the number of minutes that people are playing in the top 50 games versus the rest of us. I'll show you some data later about how the top 50 are actually accomplishing that, and that's pretty interesting. Also, we've noticed that the top 50 are back up to a 31% advantage in average revenue per paying user, largely because they've gotten back into the higher end of their catalog so that they're selling higher priced items. All right, seven days later, now we see more statistically significant difference in the retention data. The top 50 are doing a better job of holding on to their users after day seven. They're getting more minutes of usage, and they're continuing to hold on to their advantage in number of items sold, price sold, and average price per paying user. All right, two weeks later, big difference, a 40% difference in retention data. Again, they continue to hold an advantage in total minutes, and they hold their advantage in average revenue per paying user. What happens 30 days later? 30 days later, wow, a 100% difference in retention data. And again, they continue uh, making a big difference, um, holding now, a, I mean, look at that difference in actual minutes played. Um, that's a big part of how they generate more revenue and um, will show how they get that revenue from a higher price. So that's how they did numerically. Interesting data, but what did they do in order to get that kind of return? Well, that's something that we wanted to look at. And the first thing we did was we broke down in-app purchasing by hour to see kind of how that revenue was shaped. 
obviously, the first 24 hours of your game makes a really big difference here. In the study that we did, we found that apps made about 18% of their total revenue in that first 24-hour period. Here's the other interesting thing. Um, some developers have told me, listen, Mike, uh, let me go back a few slides here. Um, two weeks later, out of 100 downloads, I've only got 10 active users left. So if after two weeks I only have 10 users left, why should I care about, you know, anything after 168 hours of use? Because there are so few people there. I've lost 80% of my users, so what? I'll tell you why. I made this graph small because if you look over on this side, it goes way past 288 hours. We could just keep drawing this chart all the way out of the room into the next building. Wooga has discovered that they can get users to play and engage with their games for a year, 12 months. That's a lot of burn time for monetization. And what the top 50 know is after 30 days, they're likely to get over half of their revenue from that game from users who've been there over 30 days. How exactly does that work? Well, we took a look at that too. And what we found out was that after a user has been in your game for 30 days, they are, on average, willing to pay a 60% higher price per item than they were on day one. Think about this in your game. When you know a user has been in your game for 30 days, are you showing them the same in-app purchase items that you showed them on day one? Are you still showing them the same catalog you showed them on when they downloaded the game? Why would a user who's seen the same thing in your game for 30 days ever open an in-app purchase catalog again if it never changes? They want to spend 60% more. They're looking. Big fans of your game are looking for ways to get more value for their money, buy larger packs of coins. What are you showing them after 60 days, after 30 days? after 14 days. So, that brings up an important point. When we take a look at what the top 50 did differently, the top 50 understand these numbers. They know that, well, <laughs> first of all, what we should learn from the actual raw data is that yes, if you sell more items at a higher price, you'll make more money. You don't need me to stand here and tell you that. You guys could figure that out, right? If I could sell more things for a higher price, I'd be in the top 52. Um, what I want you to take away from that raw data is that the session count, the sessions per day count, is really important because that makes a difference when we take a look at this data. More than half of your revenue is going to come from someone's third or subsequent order. That's a lot. Are you guys, by the way, in your analytics, are you tracking how many purchases your customers have made? You probably should, because those are the guys you want to treat like gold. Next thing they understand is that 74% of the revenue, almost three quarters of their revenue, is going to happen after that 168 hour point. Even though you've lost 80% of your users after day seven, you still got three quarters of the revenue on the table. Don't forget about those users, even though there aren't many left in that retention curve. Okay, next thing, and this is big. I, so 56% happens after 30 days, we talked about that. But I mean, almost half of all repeat purchases you're gonna get are gonna happen within an hour of a previous purchase. Now, I know, I just showed you a bunch of slides that said the average session length is about seven minutes or a 7.8 minutes. So I understand if you're thinking, where does that hour come from, Mike? The hour comes from subsequent sessions. They don't make the repeat purchase in the same session. They make the repeat purchase in their next session. If it's not easy for your customers to open a subsequent session, a next session that same day, you're leaving a whole bunch of potential revenue on the table. If it's hard for them to open your game and pick up where they left off, it's gonna be hard for them to make a repeat purchase within an hour, isn't it? 
So think about that. How easy is it for your customers to go back into your game and pick up where they left off or start a new level? A lot of the people who will spend big money in your game have more than one device. They'll have a tablet, they'll have a phone. They enjoy spending time on their devices and money on your games. So a personal example, I love tower defense games, I really do. And I'll sit on my tablet uh, in the morning and maybe I'll get, you know, on a new tower defense game, I'll get to level five. And I'll put the tablet away and I'll go to work and maybe at a break at work, I'll pick up the phone and I'll open the tower defense game and I get to start at level huh, zero. I'm sorry, really? I'm not gonna play through those five levels again. I'm gonna play a different game because really I don't wanna have to redo all that. That tower defense game lost a subsequent sale for me because I couldn't play their game easily from where I left off. This is not hard. All of the game services, all of the free game services, Apple, Google Play, Amazon, they all have tools that let you synchronize player progress between devices. It's not hard to do and there's no reason you guys shouldn't do that because I really want you to capture that subsequent user sale that happens within an hour. Uh, the last data point up there I want to touch on simply because it surprised me so much. Only 37% of people, is that right, 37? Yeah, 37% of people who will ever spend money in your game actually do it on the first day. So two-thirds of the people who never spend money on the first day are still really, really important to you. So think about that. Um, and don't ignore the people who don't spend money right away. They may become some of your best customers later. So those are the things that the top 50 understand. And here's what they do about it. They introduce in-app purchasing in the tutorial. They don't make a huge deal out of it. They're not really pushy. I mean, they don't want to make it a pay-to-win game. But they do introduce it. And what we found in the games that we surveyed, the games that introduced in-app purchasing in the tutorials had a two and a half times better conversion rate than games that didn't introduce in-app purchasing in the tutorial. Well, obviously, if you're gonna have in-app purchasing, don't hide it from the users, right? I mean, let them know it's there. And kind of the tutorial is how we do that. So if you step back, it kind of makes sense that you would do that. So think about how you introduce that but not force that inside your tutorial. So, We've let users know that their in-app purchase is available. Now we need to make sure that users understand how to use them. I mean, it kind of makes sense, doesn't it? If you buy something and you don't really understand how to use it in the game, one, you'll never actually use all of it. And why would you ever buy any more? What we found when we looked at these games was if a game shows you how to use the thing you've just purchased, People will buy 64% more. Uh, they'll have 64% higher repurchase rates than games that don't show you how to use something. I've got a really good example with a tower defense game I'll show you a bit later that shows that. So um, we've introduced that there is stuff to buy. We show you how to use it. Um, oh, that's right. So you've got to have uh, stuff to buy. So catalog selection. And what I want to show you here is based on average revenue per paying user and catalog size. So you'll notice that games that had 11 to 15 in-app purchase items in their catalog ended up making 45% more revenue, average revenue per paying user than people who only had six to 10 items. Fewer than that, you lose revenue. Now, again, this is a statistic that I don't want you to misunderstand. And it's important because Nobody in the top 50 actually put 15 in-app purchase items in the same dialog box. I mean, that would be a disaster, right? I mean, you guys have seen terrible in-app purchase dialogs. You know, they're really crowded. The font is really tiny. Half of the catalog is, you have to scroll down to see it. No, I don't want you to do that. The top 50 have this many items in their catalog so that they can choose the right thing to show the right customer at the right time. So think about it, on day one, they're kind of skewing towards a less expensive side of their catalog. On day 30, guess what? 
yeah, they're showing the parts of their catalog that are 60% more expensive for good reason, because they understand that data. So the larger catalog gives them more flexibility about what items to show the right player at the right time. Okay, so we've shown them how to use, uh, we've shown them there's stuff available, we've shown them how to use it, we've, show, we've, we've got a bunch of stuff for them to use. We need to price it, we need to give them, we need to charge money for it. But you need to be careful here. You can't, well, variety is going to be really, really good in terms of your catalog. It's actually terrible in terms of prices. And what we saw is that the more price points you have, the less money you actually made. And, and step back for a second, think about this. If there's a sword for 99 cents, another sword for $1.99, and another one for $2.99, What's the benefit of spending that extra dollar or saving an extra dollar? How much difference is it really going to make? I mean, the difference between a 99 cent sword and a 499 sword, well, that's probably easy to, easier to figure out. But, okay, um, how many people took economics in school? All right, okay, this is probably the best educated audience I've spoken to in a while. So your professors told you, you know, to sell the most things, you need to have an offering for every customer, and then you will sell everything. Okay, you know what? That may work well in economics class, but our customers don't behave rationally at the margin. You know what? They get confused. A confused customer doesn't buy the most expensive thing in your catalog. Actually, a confused customer doesn't buy the least expensive thing in your catalog. Confused customer doesn't buy anything at all. So make sure that the value on each item, the value difference is really clearly spelled out. You got to be really plain with your customers about the value of the different things you've got in your catalog and having widely separated price points is good. Now, here I am telling you to have widely separated price points. Wonderful. What does that mean? We actually worked with one of our, our partners, Swerve, and we took a look at kind of the price points that make a lot of money versus where most of us actually have our price points. So, for example, most of us have a huge percentage of our catalog at zero to five dollars, but we only make about 14% of our revenue from that price range. Where do we make a lot of our revenue? Over $50. I mean, that's a steep price. I mean, that's a lot of money. So, of course, we only have about 2.5% of our catalog there, right? But if we're making so much money from that end of our catalog, why aren't we doing the right thing for our customers? The right thing for our customers who want to spend money there is to give them more choice there. And when we took a look at this data, based on what the top 50 do, we see a much more even distribution between the catalog volume and how much revenue they get. So the two different curves flatten out with a top 50. Think about how you're doing that in your game and how you're offering selection to your most valuable customers. All right, so this is a, an example of, an, of a good in-app purchasing dialog box. Um, there are not too many things. It's easy to see and read the numbers. You've got four things here that look pretty similar. Okay, maybe these are bundles. I'm not really sure what these two things are. But the bottom line is that you can see that you can buy 40,000 coins for a dollar, or you can get 4,200,000 coins for $60. Oh, more audience participation. You're going to like this. How many people in here are engineers or write code? Again, okay, so um, guys, why would you want to spend $60? Anyone? Come on, you're a room full of engineers. What's the benefit for spending $60? You get more stuff. Okay, guys, I'm talking to a room full of engineers, and you guys are sitting there right now, busy doing the math in your heads, trying to figure out why would I spend $60. Guys, your customers aren't engineers. Don't make your customers do math. Seriously, this is making it hard for your customers to spend money with you. Make it easy for your customers to see the value of what you're selling. Now, I like this a lot better. Why? 
I don't have to do math. I know I get 80% more if I spend $30. It doesn't really matter whether you like kind of a tab interface or not, but we're keeping all of the kind of um, soft currency packs on one page. Nothing on this page but soft currency packs. By the way, if you clicked over here, you'd see uh, hard currency items. But the thing is, my customer doesn't have to do math here. And that's a really strong indication that you're making the value for the customer the most important thing that they can work on. All right, so taking care of those best customers we talked about, super important. The best customers, the top 10% of your customers, according to Swerve, they're gonna generate almost half your revenue. If you don't keep track of who your best customers are, how are you gonna treat them well? Trust me, the top 50 that we interviewed all tell me they know exactly who their best customers are and they can treat them like gold. They can treat them really, really well. Make sure you guys can do the same thing. Make sure you're measuring and you understand who your best customers are. All right, so what did we learn from that? We learned that if you have bigger selection, you're gonna receive more orders, not because you pack everything into one dialogue box, but because you can sell the right thing to the right customer at the right time. We also know that if you introduce in-app purchasing in the tutorial, you'll get 65, 60, no, two and a half times better conversion. And if you show them how to consume what they've purchased, they'll have 64%, 65% higher um, reorder rates than if you don't do that. It's really important to make it easy to buy things, make it easy to shop. Highlighting value is a really big part of that. I'm going to show you another in-app purchase dialogue later about what it means exactly to make it easy to shop. Okay, so that's how the top 50 end up getting more items sold and getting more revenue per item. What do the top 50 do to actually get more time spent in the game and more sessions? Well, let's take a look at that. The first thing they do is they make it insanely easy to get a subsequent session going. Now, we talked about using the game service APIs to go ahead and synchronize progress. That's beautiful. But have you noticed how easy it is in Flappy Bird to go ahead and start a new game? What, you have to, you have to tap how many times? Well, what, once? <laughs> yeah, okay, that's easy. Have you ever played the game Connect Four? Does anyone know a game where you put four checkers in a row uh, diagonally, vertically, or horizontally? Okay, I'm seeing people nod. Um, that was one of my favorite games. I really enjoyed it. Except to start a new game, I had to tap on the icon. I got this beautiful splash screen. I had to tap start. Um, I had to tap new game or saved game. Then I had to go through all the options. Then 15 taps later, I get to start my game. Seriously? If I've got like a minute and a half to spend, I don't want to have to tap 15 times to get there. If I have a saved game going, 80% chance, that's where I want to go. Don't make me pick that. Just start me by default where you think I want to be. If it's not where I want to be, I'll go ahead and go back to the menu. That's easy for me. Don't make me choose all of the options. How wide, how tall, what color do you want to go first? Okay, take the choices I made last time, make that the default for my new game. If that's not the default I want, I'll go ahead and I'll change it but make sure that the 80% case you cover by default so I can get back in your game quickly and easily and maybe make that subsequent purchase. That's what the top 50 do, and it works really well for them. The top 50 also tune difficulty differently than a lot of us do. When we want to maximize our in-app purchase revenue, a lot of us go ahead and tune difficulty to try to encourage people to spend money on lives, on points, on coins, uh, to, make, to make purchases. Unfortunately, that creates a pay-to-win game. And none of us actually like playing pay-to-win games, so why do we write them? What the top 50 are doing is they're tuning the game difficulty to maximize next level start. So they make the game just easy, just hard enough, so that when they finish a level, they want to start the next level. And that keeps them engaged in the game longer. It keeps them wanting to play the next level. So even if they don't have time, 
That's what they want to do is start the next level. And that's going to drive subsequent sessions that gives you the opportunity to have repeat sales. So absolutely think about optimizing for next level start as opposed to just trying to optimize for short-term revenue. It's going to make a big difference for you. The top 50 also communicate well with their customers. And what we found is, well, actually we found a lot of data from a bunch of different providers. And Aptentive did a really good job of finding that Developers who actually communicate with their customers, for example, replying to reviews in the App Store, generated four times more user retention after three months than the developers who didn't do that. And it's not hard to respond to people who write reviews in the App Store. If someone gives you a one-star review and says, your game sucks, an easy reply is, wish I knew why. And maybe that person will never respond. But everybody else who's reading that review will see that you responded asking for input. If someone says, hey, love your game, just type thanks. It makes you human. It turns you from a them developer into a him or a her developer. It humanizes you. And when that happens, you get more reviews, and the reviews tend to be about a half star better. So really, the top 50, they're engaging with their customers on multiple levels. And that kind of social engagement can help create buzz, word of mouth advertising. Now, there are all kinds of different social things you can do, like, you know, you know hey, I'm playing this game on Facebook. So they're connected with Facebook buttons all over. Um, that's kind of the minimum level entry. Um, another kind of minimum level entry is like a leaderboard and achievement. Now, Leaderboards and achievements, again, come free with all of the game, uh, the, the game engines out there. They come free with all the game services, Google, Apple, Amazon. And you got to put this stuff in your game if you can. And I'll give you, uh, again, a personal example. There was um, a geography game that I played with my son when he was 12. And guys, this was a stupid geography game. It just showed you a map of a country, it told you what the country was, and you had four choices, A, B, C, D, and you had to pick the capital. Any one of you guys could write this in a long weekend. It wasn't hard. So we're playing the game, and of course I win, and so we stopped playing the game, and that was fun and everything. Um, I'm at work, I'm in, a, I'm in a meeting, and my phone buzzes. I take out my phone, your son has beaten your high score. Really? I'm sorry. That, that's, okay, well, no worries. I, you know, quickly played another game, and of course, I, I beat his high score. And everything was right with the world. Except a couple hours later at my desk, I get another notice, your son has beaten your high score. Now, wait just a minute. I travel around the world for a living. This is not okay. So for a week... We went back and forth like this, playing that stupid game, generating ad impressions, generating extra lives for in-app purchase opportunities. For a week we did this. It was a stupid little game. But because I couldn't let him do better than I did, we played that game for a week. Think about how you're going to appeal to you know, type A people in your game in your life. That took... It, well, when I did this with one of my games, it took me about 35, 40 minutes to implement leaderboards and achievements. Guys, it's not hard work for huge benefits, so think about that. The graduate course on how to do this comes from Walt Disney, and I love the way they did this. The game you're looking at here is called Club Penguin. Club Penguin is a massive multiplayer online game designed for pre-teens and early teens. You have um, a North Pole environment. You play a cute little penguin. It has an igloo to live in. It has these cute little things that uh, the puffles are called pets. And they're absolutely adorable. And one day, this 12-year-old girl drew some pictures of her penguin and her puffles, and she posted them to her Facebook page. Well, what do you think Disney's attorneys did? Okay, 
Most of you are thinking Disney's attorneys wrote this really formal letter. You know, this is copyrighted Disney material. Uh, you don't have the right cease and desist, remove immediately from your Facebook site, right? That's exactly what a corporate attorney would send to a 12-year-old girl, right? No. Disney's attorneys were brilliant. You'll never hear me say that about attorneys, really. But in this case, Disney's attorneys were brilliant. They sent her a mail saying, if your parents approve, we'll take your art and we'll put it up on the Club Penguin webpage. Well, how long do you think it took before she had mom and dad's permission to put that up there? So she went to school that next week and she's talking to her friends. Yeah, my art is up on the Club Penguin website. Okay, her friends are like, no way. So what happens when her friends get home? They go to Club Penguin, and what do you know? There's her art. And her friends are looking at that, thinking, I can do better than that. I can do way better than that. So now all of her friends are getting Club Penguin accounts, creating art, and sending it off to Disney. There's an entire middle school of 12-year-old girls who all have Club Penguin accounts because Disney did one thing. They made it easier for their biggest fans to share what they loved about the game. Putting up a website to store images is so simple, guys. Come on, this is not hard work. When you have people who absolutely love your game, are you giving them any way to share that with people? If you have a city builder game, people wanna take pictures of the city they've built, post it up here. It shows what's possible, it shows that people are passionate, and other people are gonna say, well, I can build one better than that, and they're gonna build something. Or maybe you'll inspire someone to build a city building game that maybe actually spells out a word or something. Super easy to do and super effective. Social is gonna make a big difference in getting more minutes per session, more sessions per day, which is gonna generate higher average revenue per paying user. Okay, tower defense games. I told you I love tower defense games. This is gonna be about making it easy to buy. So how many people know Bloons Tower Defense? Okay, oh, you're my people. I love you. Okay, so the tower defense games are great. You've got a bunch of balloons that enter the maze. They go through the path, and if they exit the path, that's bad. You lose lives. Fortunately, you've got a bunch of dart-throwing monkeys. I'm not kidding. Somebody gave a bunch of monkeys darts, and they're throwing these things at the balloons. F super fun game. Except when you've been working on a level for about 20 minutes, you're almost done, and the last wave of balloons makes it past your last monkey, and you're thinking, I need to get these. So, not a problem, right? You come over here, and you click on something that's locked, because, well, you can spend money, and you can buy something that'll pop those balloons, right? Actually, no, not in this game. If you want to get an upgrade for this game, you have to quit the level, go back to the main level, choose the right submenu. In the right submenu, you have to choose the right little building you need to go to, and then maybe you can buy an upgrade. I mean, seriously? If I have to quit the level to buy something, I'm just gonna put my monkeys in a different place. I'm not gonna actually buy anything at all. I'm gonna put my towers somewhere else. Okay, the people at Ninja Kiwi who actually make this game, smart people, they learned from this. And their next tower defense game <laughs> has zombies. Okay, my two favorite things, tower defense games and zombies. I love this game. And so I'm playing the game and exactly the same thing happens. A whole bunch of zombies come through the maze. The zombies make it past my machine guns and my snipers. And there's a huge knot of zombies about to infect my human population. Well, I can't let that happen. So what do I do? Well, over here on this menu, I can get a nuclear hand grenade. Wait, why anyone ever thought it was okay to give a nuclear hand grenade to a soldier, I don't know. But I decided I'd go ahead and, and buy one. So I clicked on it, and for 99 cents, I don't just get one, I get three. And it shows me how to use it. Awesome. So my knot of zombies is down here. I click on it, I drag the nuclear hand grenade down, and boom! 
arms and legs, bloods and brains everywhere. It's colossally messy. It was wonderful. I loved it. Oh, and, and my human population was saved. That was awesome. And the reason that they sold that is because they offered me what I needed when I needed it. And they did a good job of separating grindable items, soft currency items, from hard currency items. You can see the stuff that I can grind for over here. These are all my soft currency items on, on the left. My hard currency items over here on the right I need to spend money on. Super clear, super obvious, and super available when I want to buy something. Now, that nuclear hand grenade explosion was so cool. I didn't really need to buy anything else, but you know what? If the hand grenade was that awesome, I went out and bought an Apache attack helicopter just to see what it would do to the zombies. So again, that experience that I paid for with the hand grenades was such a delightful experience, I wanted more of those experiences. And yeah, I needed to pay for them, but I got more than my money's worth because I got an amazing experience for a fair price. I'm excited about spending money in their game. In your game, how easy do you make it for customers to delight in spending money and making it easy, them, easy for them to get what they want when they want it? In the study we did, when developers make it easy to get what you want when you want it, they have a 75% increase in average revenue per paying user. Think about that in your game. All right, the last thing that the top 50 developers do is A-B testing. They A-B test everything. One of the product managers at Wooga told me that they do a lot of play testing, they do a lot of research, and at the end of the day, they have a pretty good idea about what they want to do. And about half of those ideas are wrong. They just don't know which half. A-B testing lets them fine-tune those things. It lets them get down to what exactly the numbers should be, exactly the difficulty, and exactly what items to offer the right people at the right time. They A-B test everything. Last time I checked, there are about six A-B testing frameworks available to use for mobile games. Um, no reason not to do them. Most of them, you can actually change your game in real time while the players are actually playing the game. So think about how cool it is to be able to change the behavior of your game while it's being played. So A-B testing is really cool. So taking a look at how the top 50 got those retention numbers, they change their difficulty and they add social to increase the length of the sessions and the number of sessions per day. They differentiate their catalog again and make value really clear and really easy for customers to understand. And they give themselves control. They don't hope they're doing the right thing when they make a coding decision. They know they're doing the right thing because they've A-B tested it. So this is, this is a lot of data to throw at you guys in one presentation. I understand that. So if you can do just one thing, I want you to differentiate your IAP catalog. I want you to show the players who have been in your game for 30 days different stuff than you showed them when they were in your game on that first day. Okay, so, well, I lied. I want you to remember two things. I want you to make sure that you differentiate your catalog, and I want you to be super clear about value. Okay, remember, don't make your customers do math. Really, if you take one thing away, don't make your customers do math. So hopefully that gives you guys um, a good place to start. If you want to kind of catch up on the stuff that I've talked about today, you can go ahead and um, get a book. We've actually compiled everything that I've just talked about in this book that you can get. It's available, the PDF is available for free. So just go to this bit.ly URL, go click on the PDF, and you can download this book for free. It has this presentation and the data uh, and some other really good items in it too. So you guys can have a reference available to you anytime you want it. So that about covers it for me, guys. Thank you very much for your time. Um, I hope this has been useful for you. Thank you, Mike. I actually have a math-related question. How many games per year do you play? Oh, geez, how can I keep track of that? 
I judge maybe a one, one and a half game contests a month. Each of those has me look at between 20 to, to 50 games. So hundreds and hundreds of games every year. That's great. Mm -hmm. uh, do we have questions? Uh, guys, if you want to ask a question, just raise your hand, okay? I'm just, uh, you said that people hate to win and to hate to pay to win. Mm -hmm. So essentially what you did with that game where you bought the nuclear hand grenade, wasn't that pay to win? No, because just like the, uh, the other times that I've played it, I could go ahead and, and lose that one and position my towers a little bit differently or upgrade them in a different order and have more success. Paying for the nuclear hand grenade was a shortcut so they didn't need to play that level one more time and make one more tweak to my machine gun nest. So yeah, The thing is that pay to win means that you have to pay to win. You have to. You cannot win unless you pay, and that's bad. That's everybody uh, mm -hmm. hates it. And what Mike is describing is that you cannot. You can continue playing without pain, and that's mm -hmm. important. Do we have more questions? Okay, uh, one more question for me. Yes. Uh, could you please tell us a few reasons why bring your game to the Amazon App Store? Oh, first of all, the Amazon App Store customer base is really good. Our customers tend to be older, they tend to be female, and we actually have a much higher average revenue per paying user um, than other stores. I think the easiest thing about it is that it's an Android-based app store. So you can take the APK you already have, and 80% of the APK submitted just work with no additional engineering required. Okay, uh, if I want to get some featuring on the store, are you the right person to talk to? I am the right person to talk to, even better, is download the book. There is a chapter in the book on how to maximize your chance of getting featured on the Amazon App Store. Follow the instructions there. When you've submitted the form, send me an email. I can't make the feature team feature you, but I can show them the game. All right. Well, thank you very much for an amazing presentation. If anyone has questions, you can always come up to Mike and ask him personally. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you very much.